Hello everyone, uh, I'm Jitendra Chauhan and uh, I'm techno technology enthusiast, right? I'm iVision, I'm privileged to work with Vikash and Elanjan in iVis when it got acquired, ultimately got acquired by Sizital and I'm part of Sizital. Currently my responsibility is to integrate Sizital worldwide services with our product. I'm managing their, you know, currently product which they acquired iVis for. So, <clears throat> so today we are going to talk about uh, science behind RASP and IST. Now, so when you go to web, Google, you, when you search RASP and IST, you will get a lot of marketing materials. This will tell you overall how it works, what are the advantages, disadvantages of both of these technologies and advantages over other previous technologies. But it will not tell you the science, what is inside it, what is behind it, right? What technologies are behind it to build it, okay? So today I'm going to do that and it is a bit uh, te technical session, so I hope you enjoy it. And if you have questions, just you know, stop me and ask anytime, okay? So the agenda will be, uh, we'll talk about how RASP and IS got evolved. What were the main drivers behind it, right? So we'll talk a little bit talk about web evolution, security evolution. Then I'll give you a marketing view of RASP and IS, which you, I will summarize RASP and IS from marketing point of view, which you'll find on Google so, you don't, so, so that you don't have to go through the pain again, okay? Then I will talk about some science behind RASP and IS. I will talk about some two of the core technologies that made it possible. Those are instrumentation and dynamic taint analysis, okay? And then we can discuss way forward and question answers. So, in, so we have, so you, so you might be already knowing a lot of technologies in the, in the context of application security, right? And to give you a, a different perspective from, you know, other like Gartner and all those people, I, I, what I decided is I decided to draw the whole technology stack on y-axis, right? The technology stack, at the top of technology stack are developers who actually build the code, who are developing the code. And at the bottom is your network where you deploy your web application, right? And on, x, on x-axis, I, you know, I've taken the timeline, rough timeline, where, where the technology has evolved. And then I found some interesting things in it, which I want to share with you. And I hope you, you find it also very interesting. So when application security started, it started with some of the core technologies, which were doing best in their own way, but then had some gaps, right? One of them was DAST, Dynamic Application Security Testing. Everyone knows about it, right? Okay. Second one was SAST, Static Application Security Testing. So basically you take Piece of, you take a binary code or source code, you, you give it to SAS tools, SAS tool will analyze it using compiler-based technologies like tent and static tent analysis, and will give you a set of vulnerabilities. So this is how it works, right? And then you have WAF, where you take a web application firewall, you deploy it at perimeter level, you configure its signatures. When attacker will try to attack, it will identify those patterns using signature-based technology, and it will try to block those attacks, right? Now, as you will notice that the top layer, the solutions at the top layer are, are basically prevention solutions. So basically, you prevent the vulnerabilities at, at this layer. You prevent the vulnerability. You find it, you fix it, rather than you deploy vulnerabilities in, in, the, in the code. And if you notice that at the bottom layer, you have protection technologies, which means you deploy it and then that those technologies will actually protect it from attacks, right? Then we also had, you know, security libraries like ESAPI, which developers can use to write secure code, right? And we also had training for developers. So this was the first breed of, you know, tools and technologies and methodologies before 2010, you know, timelines, Rough timelines, these are all rough timelines, okay? So as you will notice that there is a gap between these layer. Now this web container layer is like when you deploy an application in a container like Tomcat or JBoss, that, right? So this is that layer. And then you have a JVM or JRE layer where your, you know, JVM runs. So JVM 
uh, container runs on JVM, right? And then you have OS layer. So as you can see that during that point of time, there was very less known technology in this layer. Right? There was technologies up and there was technologies down. But in this layer, there was very less. Okay. Now, I will also talk about some of the gaps that made RASP and IS possible, that made them possible. So, as if you know the SAST, the SAST is very good at, not so good, I mean, they are very different opinions, but then SAST works good at finding you know, some of the OS top 10 vulnerabilities like SQL injection, cross-site scripting, HTTP response splitting, LDAP, all the injection kind of things. Okay. They are very good at finding code level insecurities like null pointer dereference, threading issues, code quality issues, and cryptographic issues, right? Because they can actually go through the code. They can go through high level, you know, the, the workflow at the code level, right? So they can find it. But on the other hand, the SAS solution, you know, produce a lot of false positives, right? Because they think every, they, they know the dangerous functions inside the code. So they think everything can be a possibility of a vulnerability. So they produce a lot of false positives, right? On the other hand, they, are, they also find it very difficult when it comes to runtime code generations. Like a lot of languages, you know, even in Java, you can actually load code at runtime. You can load a library jar file from net and load it at runtime. So when, then, when that runtime library is not available during static code analysis, it won't be able to find it, find those vulnerabilities, right? And then also some of the dynamic languages made, it, made its life a bit harder. On the other hand, you have DEST. So DEST does a very good job at, again, at OS top 10 vulnerabilities. But then it also did good job at other kind of vulnerabilities, which says were not doing it better, like Authorization issues, authentication issues, session management issues, insecure in third party libraries, right? Business logic vulnerabilities, logical vulnerabilities, which right now only Dest can do it, no, no other tool can do it, and protocol parser issues. On the other hand, it also had some drawbacks. The drawbacks were that Dest, the drawbacks were like Web 2.0 technologies like Ajax, Flash, uh, JSON. So the, 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 the packets had a lot of various formats when, when client, from client to server. And then DEST find it really difficult to you know, you know, parse it and kind of fuzz it and send it to the server. Similarly, it also had some of the problems like integrity and uh, availability const, you know, violation issues, which means there is a, always a possibility that on a production server, an at, uh, a uh, ethical hacker can always bring, bring, bring it down, always change the integrity of the server by always by sending a malicious you know, uh, signature. Right? On, and lastly, it has long execution times. So for large applications, it never stops. I mean, whoever has experience with it has realized it, it never stops. If you run the scanner, it will, probably it will never finish. Right? So these are some of the gaps in SAS test and some of the key things, right? But both of them has one gap right now, which is time to discover, the time between time to discover to time to fix. So just discovery is not enough. You need to fix it. And that's what it doesn't cover. It just tells you the vulnerabilities. It doesn't fix it. That's, what we're, that's where WAF comes into picture. So WAF, the good thing is, you can just go and patch the vulnerabilities without changing your code, right? So that's the very good thing about WAF. But then the main disadvantage of WAF were that it was signature based. So it basically takes the request, it matches with the signature. If it matches, it's a, it, it infer that it is an attacker's request, it blocks it. But then there is a possibility of false, false positives and false negatives, right? The false positives bring you know, business continuity issues. What if it blocks a legitimate request, right? And what if attacker can actually bypass those signatures? So you will see in a lot of conferences, there have been a lot of talks about web bypass, right? And again, there was no, uh, there was no uh, protection against business, logical, business logic vulnerabilities, right? So as you can see that they were, these technologies were doing good in their areas, but there were, were quite of gaps in each of one, each, each one of them. 
So what did AppSec, AppSec community did is they tried to you know combine some of them together, right? So someone came with okay dash plus web. So they take the output of a dash and you know, give it as an input to the web and try to see okay whether it can you can solve the problem of false positives or false negatives, right? Similarly, people have come up with hybrid technologies like people have like Ivis was the first one who came with hybrid technology where he com they combined human plus tools together to find all classes of vulnerabilities. Similarly, people have combined, AppSec team has combined SAST and DAS, which means you take uh, output of SAST or output of SAST and give it to the DAS, right? But then people realized that it, it, it is not going to work. The reason is that they talk in different languages. So the SAST give you an output like you, have, you may have a vulnerability at file xyz.java at line number 61, but then desk requires an input of what should be my, what should be the parameter and what should be the payload and what should be the request. So how to combine this line number and file to the, actually the payload and parameter, right? So this integration actually never is, is not working and probably never going to work, right? And there where it comes, the reason is that all these tools lacks the execution context. So all these tools are not aware of what's happening when actually attacker sends a request and how, it, how the data flows from you know, one file to actually the database, whether that and whether it actually hits the database at all, right? So this execution context is missing in each one of them. So this is where the new technologies came, which is called IS. So IS means Interactive Application Security Testing, right? Similarly, RASP, which means Runtime Application Security Testing, right? So what RASP is, security built from inside, right? So assume that if a legitimate request comes, your web server, your database server, everything works fine. But when a malicious request comes, just before hitting the database, just before you actually execute the request, you find it in malicious and you block it. So that's called security from inside, right? Similarly, IS means you instrument the code. You instrument the code. You find out how data flows from servlets to database, right? And then you apply your DEST you know, logic. You, you basically apply your DEST fuzzing rules. And then you find out, you take both of them together and infer whether there is a vulnerability or not. So this is what IST is, right? So as you can see that both of them actually now has the execution context of the program, right? So this is where the new technologies are coming up. This middle layer is actually going to be the key in the next coming years. And you will see that not just this, people are now creating uh, real-time feedback to developers, right? So there is a tool developing by Sigital called Codioscope. What it does is it gives developers real-time feedback about secure coding based upon his last patterns of coding, right? And, and static analysis of the code. Similarly, you have, there are some technologies which talks about secure JVM. So basically what they do is they do JVM level analysis, okay? To find out whether there are malicious executions at JVM level. Okay. Similarly, at network layer, you have something called bot wall or polymorphic code, which Nilanjan is going to talk about, right? So it's not signature based, it's polymorphic code. And also, we need, also there, is, there are some technologies who talks about deception. So if there is an attack, don't stop it, let it happen, but then you divert it to a, say, honeypot at runtime so that you can get more information about the attacker, right? So this is the evolution of technologies and what, what the next breed of technologies are coming is actually this layer which talks about, which actually means that they know the execution context of a program. And now how they do it, what is the secret sauce, that's what I'm going to talk about today, right? Okay, so before we jump to instrumentation and dynamic tent analysis, which are the two secret sauce behind these two technologies, I will give you a marketing overview, I will say, which basically tells you how it actually works from very basic level. 
and I will take uh, this and little bit of animation to explain you. So I will tell you how first SQL injection works and then I will tell you how RASP will block it. Then I will tell you how IST will find it, right? Okay, so assume that we have this uh, web application where you have an attacker here or user, malicious user. You have a firewall and the data flows from firewall to you know, OS, web server, application server, and to your application code, which is a custom code or legacy code. And from the code, it again flows from again to firewall to your database or maybe your web services. Right? So this is a typical deployment model. Right? Now, when a request, when attacker sends a request, right, which, which may be a, you know, some malicious request like this, which everyone knows about, is a typical SQL injection pattern, right? It goes to your custom code, application code. And an application, what it does is it finds what is the input. It converts that into a SQL query, right? So this is a SQL query from the input. And you can see that there is a SQL injection going on here, right? Then what it does is it sends that SQL query back to the, back to the database. And from the database, database executes this, gives back the result to the application code again. And application code, again, gives the results back to the attacker, which actually is like execution of a you know, SQL injection where he can get a data which he's not supposed to get. So this is basic how SQL injection works, right? Nothing new about it. Now let me tell you how a REST will block it. Okay, so the same same setup. Attacker sends a so same setup. What REST does initially is it first instruments the code. It places the agent at one or multiple places of your deployment. Right. So suppose you have an application server, or web server, or your custom code, or maybe database. It places an agent there. Agent. What an agent does is it monitors the execution flow of the program. How it does, we will talk about a bit later. Okay? But it does. Assume it does. Now when attacker sends the same request to application server, it goes fine. Up to application server, it goes there. Right? But here what is happening is agent is stop, has started monitoring this execution flow. From the point the request hits the server, where, you, where the server will get this malicious input, it's, it has started monitoring the execution flow, right? But it is not doing anything right now, okay? So when an application will create a SQL query and will try to send it to database to execute, it will block. So what it will do is, it, when application will execute command, say, execute SQL, you know, function call, it will instrument that function call, it will block there and we'll try to analyze whether the input that user has given has actually modified the SQL query in a bad, in a bad way, right? which actually in this case it is. If it does, then it's override that function and then sends the exception back to the server. It doesn't execute on the database because that's where the malicious activity will happen. Right now, nothing gone has happened. Nothing wrong has happened to application, right? So, it sends back the exception back to the server and server sends back the same exception to the attacker. So as you can see that it's monitoring the code, it's monitoring the execution flow from the request level to just before execution. It's blocking there, it sends back the exception back to the attacker again. So it's not executing. So this is how overall REST works. Okay. All right. Any questions here? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you have to maintain uh, that uh, pattern, right? So there are many. Uh, so your question is good. You are asking. I think you are asking is that how does what is this? how does? I'm sorry. Just one moment. Okay. So whether the application keeps track of all malicious patterns to identify yes. this, yes. same as what WAF were doing it? Yes. Uh, the answer is not really. 
what happens actually at the code before just executing this SQL query, you have this SQL, you have this query, right? Yes. And what it is, if you, if you notice that it is a SQL query and it can be passed into a syntax tree, right? So SQL is also a language, right? And it can be passed into a syntax tree. Now in that syntax tree, if one node, which is actually, is, is one node is controlled by an attacker, then actually that SQL query is malformed. Right. Yeah, so, so my question is here the RASP also having like, uh, uh, like we have suppose at network layer IDS IPS. So we right. are putting down its knowledge base that means we are writing the signature and if the signature match that pattern match is happen, whatever the pattern we are putting they are blocking and they are taking the action. So same way the RASP must know whatever the query must execute from the legitimate user and so which is not going to execute. So that need to maintain by the application owner. So that's what we are going to talk about today. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to talk about dynamic tent analysis. That answers your question. How it actually does it. Okay. Right? So I will just hold on for some time. We will come to that. Okay? okay. All right. Okay. So this, this should have done uh, in the coding, I think that is another uh, area we also need to see, right? So uh, I agree that there is a, uh, there is a tool which can detect it, but the, we, that is, the issue is much bigger than that, right? I so why right. the code, whatever the code it is, you might put any, any kind of uh, uh, protect, protection or prevention at the uh, server level, but still the code itself has this uh, vulnerability, right? It's still, it's still adjust, mm -hmm. right? You might be fixing it momentarily, but it can come through a different channel. I think what need to be done is the code need to be fixed. That's, That's the correct. key. Yes. So I always say, don't fix in the code. Fix in the developer. Developer, exactly. Right? The developers need to be trained properly so yes. that they, sh they shouldn't be doing it. This is the first thing on the top of the list of OWASP. That need to be fixed. So there are two things. Number one, what you're saying is very true. Fix in the developer and then in the code, of course. Correct. But then as part of their, their various kind of bugs that happens logical, there are, for example, logical bugs, where one developer context will not be able to fix it. They are like one developer mistake, second developer mistake, third developer mistake, combined together, one bug. That's number one. Number two is, it's, it's not that easy. Like, they are, uh, when we hire, like for us, we hire like, freshers from college, they get, they, they are just learning to code. They have no idea about security. Right. Then they will have some. Co they will know some coding. Then they will try to find out what SQL injection is. Then they will try to you know try to do something very stupid. They will try to uh, you know try to fix it, but not in a in, in a way that it should should have been fixed. So the answer is that 80 percent of the vulnerabilities can be fixed at developers, but then for to rest 20 percent of the vulnerabilities, simple 80-20 rule has to be fixed at these layers because you don't want to take the risk. What if a developer makes a mistake? What, what happens after that? OK, so now I'm going to talk about IAST. OK, so IAST and REST works on fundamentally at the same principle. OK, both instrument the code, both do some kind of taint analysis. But they are very different way to mitigate the vulnerabilities. IAST doesn't protect applications, IS discover the vulnerabilities, right? And you need to, you know, mitigate it, you need to fix it in the code. So how, the, how it works is, apart, so in, in the earlier case you have an attacker, in this case there are two things, number one is a DEST engine, which is your scanner, okay? Another thing is a correlation engine, we will just see how it works, just after some point of time, okay? So execution works in the same way, yeah, another thing it does is it instruments the code in the same way RASP has done. So it has, it is placed some agents either in web server, application server, in your code, maybe other database, right? Same, similar setup, only one difference. Now, again, when dashed engine sends a input, you know, sends a request, which is, which is, has some fuzzing parameters, fuzzing payload, which can be simple SQL, SQL injection payload, the application code again builds the same query, right? It sends the query back to the database. Same thing, but here what's happening is the 
agent which is there on your application core database is actually monitoring the whole execution flow, even up to the end, even up to the point where your final query is being built and is being executed by your execute SQL command, for example, right? So everything works same way, only difference is it just monitors the whole execution flow. And then finally, when the data is sent back, the response is sent back to Dest engine, this agent sends the feedback back to correlation engine. So it tells you what was the query built, what is the execution flow, what was the method called, and so on. So now your Dest engine has, and from Dest engine you know what payload I sent, what is the response I have. Now from this whole context, your correlation engines actually tells whether the vulnerability is confirmed or whether it is not confirmed. So this is a very fundamental thing which works in a similar way as RASP, what IS does. And this is how it works better than maybe, you know, just combining SES and DES together, because it knows the execution flow, right? So now let's talk about some science. What is inside RASP and IS actually is? So this is, so now you know how it works. So what, what, what is inside it? So if you look at RASP, fundamentally they are two pillars of REST. One is instrumentation logic. Okay, so at instrumentation, it instruments your app containers, Tomcat, JBoss, and maybe others. It instruments your database layer, your JDBC, Hibernate, instruments every, every library of those layers, possible every libraries. Okay. It also instruments your frameworks like Struts, Spring, and whatever frameworks you are using, right? So what, so we will talk about instrumentation a bit later, just hold on, okay. And then it also has another pillar called dynamic taint analysis. So it, it came actually from static taint analysis used by SEST. But the only difference here is dynamic taint analysis uh, monitors the whole execution flow when the request has come to the request being executed. Just one flow it monitors. It, do, it doesn't have to, you know, go through the, all the possible flows at one single point of time, right? And now in dynamic tent analysis, there are various components, including what, what is my, so what is a taint? Okay, before even we jump to that, I will explain you what is taint analysis. Okay, so what is a taint? Taint means, uh, taint you consider is a tag, a tag that's, that you can, so that you can, you know, apply it to something. It may be a variable, it can be a function which actually tells that, that it can be malicious, can be malicious, okay? So it's a tag, this tells you it can be malicious and you want to track it, track it activity, right? So taint source means it has a component called taint source, which means it has to find what are the sources of inputs which can be malicious. It can be your, you know, servlet function called J, get parameter, which actually gets the parameter from the request and that's where everything starts, okay? Then it has another component called taint propagation. How those taint or tags will propagate to other variables, right? Because your variables will be, will be you know, used at various functions. It will, you will use various operators to combine it. You create new variables and so on in a coding, while coding. So you need to know how that taint will get propagated to new variables you are introducing in, in the program, right? And finally, it knows taint sync, where the taint is actually being used, and those syncs are your execute SQL statements, for example. It can be also, generally it is a SQL statement, or it can be something where you store into a file, or you, create, you read from the file, all those functions are actually syncs, okay? And then it also has taint policy. So taint policy actually, in taint policy you can configure, and this, this is where everything interesting starts. This is where the, the, the bottlenecks of RASP and IS will start. I will tell you why later on. So taint policy will tell you, tell you what can be your taint sources, what can be your taint propagation rules, and what can be your taint sinks. So this is where the taint policy will have. This is what taint policy will have. And after that, some of the RAS solution may also have an exploit analyzer, which means once the exploit, once the exploit has been triggered, up to the point execution has been done, it can tell you what parameter the exploit, 
because of what parameter exploit is, because of what weakness the exploit has, has been made possible. So it has a component called exploit analyzer, right? Now similarly, your components, similarly the IST has a similar components, but they work in a bit different way. It also has instrumentation, it also has dynamic taint analysis. Apart from that, it also has a correlation engine, what we saw. And another component which it has, which is not shown here, is your DEST engine, which actually is a scanner. Right. So we'll now talk about how the science happened. How does it work, actually work? So first I'm going to talk about instrument, how instrumentation works. Now instrumentation is not a new. Instrumentation is there from the time when Java is there or .NET is there. Because it has been used by all of your performance monitoring tools, right? But it is very interesting that that technology is being reused in security, right? In IST and RASP. So how does uh, instrumentation work? Let me give you an example. So in instrumentation you have, so you have an Apache Tomcat con web container, right? And Apache Tomcat web container runs on JVM, isn't it? And inside JVM, if you look, a very simplified view of JVM is that it has a set of class loaders. So if you know JVM, like it loads your Java classes into its, you know, execution engine, right? And so that loading is done by a set of class loaders. So it reads classes from file or maybe a URL. It compiles it, perform bytecode verification, and it then loads it into something called uh, runtime data, you know, Runtime data uh, access, okay. Runtime data areas, which is actually your uh, method area where your code is actually get stored. Just like in a normal computation model, your code is stored in a RAM, right? Execution co code area. Similarly, it also has a method area where all the code is being stored, and where the program counter will start executing. Okay. It also has a constant pool where all the constants is being stored, including your string constant integers, floating points, everything, Java classes, names, interface names, everything is stored in a uh, constant pool. It also has a thread stacks. So for every thread in Java, there is a stack. Okay. It also has a heap. So everyone knows about it. So what happens in instrumentation is that you, pro so Java provides a library called instrumentation library. And that instrumentation library Using that instrumentation library, you create a package, again, jar file, which is your instrumentation agent in Java. It's called instrumentation agent in Java. So what it does is when you start your JVM, it loads that instrumentation engine in JVM. Okay? And then when you start your program, it starts loading all those classes, passing it to the instrumentation agent. Instrumentation agent will pass those classes, convert that insert some of its code into these classes and again give back to class loader. And then class loader again will, will do its normal job. It will store it into a method area. So this is how all the classes being transformed by instrumentation agent and being stored into the method area. Right? So this is how instrumentation works. Now, this is a very simplified view. Any questions here? Right, so very good question. So performance hit, first of all, it's not a known. For instrumentation, I can tell you, but for RASP, in the context of RASP and IS, whoever vendors are, they have not published their performance things, right? But it can vary from 10% to maybe 20 to 30%. Yeah, that's, that's one of the, you know, gray area of RASP technologies. That's, what, that's where, where the challenges begins. Whether you want to take that performance hit on your server or not, that's like, but then, yeah, that's, that, that's the CIOs or CISOs have to decide, you know. Other. Not, so this instrumentation works above Tomcat server, not the OS level. There are other instrumentation frameworks which actually works at the OS layer, but not the one I'm describing. Uh, there are some pr products who are actually doing instrumentation at JVM level. So actually what they do is they ship a JVM to you, which is actually instrumented already. Yes, yes. And that probably have a better performance.
but we don't know. I mean, no one published those results. Okay, so how instrumentation works is another view, a bit closer to programmer. So when you run a Java program, you specify a command line called agent, Java agent, right? Is a command line argument. And then you specify your jar file, which is actually your instrumented code, instrumentation agent. And then you run your program. You specify class file, you specify Tomcat, whatever. In Tomcat also, you can go and specify this argument and specify your agent or jar. And then Tomcat will load that jar and instrument, uh, instrument every class file that it will load from, say, a war file. Right? And how it works is, first, JVM calls the agent pre-main class in, which is specified in manifest. So when you create an agent jar, you specify, there is a manifest file, which is say a meta file, where you specify what is my entering function, what is my pre-main function, where is, where is location. And this is where JVM will call that function. The JVM will know, okay, I just want to call this function and everything will happen after that. It's taken care of by agent, right? So in, inside this pre-main, you do your whatever you want to do. If you want to just print what classes it, has, it is loading, you, you can do that. If you want to do instrumentation, you can do that. And then generally what it's done, when you want to instrument, Java also provides a, a API called instrumentation API. And using that instrumentation API, you can actually load your transformers in Java, right? So when I describe, right, when, it, when class loader loads class files, it, it convert, it basically gives those class files to a transformer. And transformer actually, you know, inject code inside your jar file, inside, inside your code. So this is where you can do that. Okay. If you have questions on it, maybe we can take it offline, because this is like a highly technical talk, uh, thing right, I'm talking about. So, I will just stop here at instrumentation level because after that things become more technical. I'm just touching at the surface. I will quickly talk about dynamic taint analysis quickly. Now, because you know that, okay, instrumentation works and this is how you can instrument it overall. If you have questions, I will take it. Now, let's see how taint analysis works, right? So, in taint analysis, so this is a simple piece of code, a simplified piece of code. You read a X, which is a variable which is being initialized to a username parameter of a request using this method, right? Then you use that X variable to create more variables. Maybe you do some modifications, you append more things into it, and you create more, another variable called Y. And then you use Y to execute a query called execute SQL query, right? Now, I will tell you how RASP or IS actually finds out that actually Y is malicious, Y is tainted. Okay, a very simple way, looks very simple. How it does it, whenever, so as part of taint policy, I, I figured, I tells my taint analyzer that whenever there is a get query function, whatever it returns, mark it tainted. Label it with a tag which says it is malicious, right? And then whenever it is being used, so here X is marked as tainted, right? And whenever X is being used, and y is being produced, I will also mark y as tainted because y is produced from x and x is malicious and probably y may be malicious, right? And then if I use y at some dangerous functions like execute SQL, which are my taint sinks I discussed, okay? I will find out that there is something, some policy violation happening, something malicious happening inside my activity, right? Okay, so this is how actually it knows that yeah, uh, this is malicious, this is not malicious, okay? Tensing, so tensing is, maybe you can consider as a collection of dangerous functions, like command, execution of command, execution of query, OS command functions, wherever things actually happen, like executions, those you can consider as taint sync. Sync means where the, very, where the malicious input will go, ultimately reach, right? Those are taint syncs, okay? So, in, on paper, it looks very simple, but when I show you this slide, this is a typical taint propagation rules. Okay, for computer scientists, I can read it nicely, but this is what it goes inside taint propagation rules. Actually, what it does is, what it says, 
if this is the condition, if this is the condition, then you mark it tainted, right? So like first rule says, if y is an input from a source, okay, then and and v is initialized from get input source, then mark v mark v as tainted, okay? This is what it says. This is a typical compiler. This is called operation semantics in compiler, which is used in dynamic taint analysis. Okay, so now you know instrumentation, now you know dynamic taint analysis. Now I will tell you what are the challenges with dynamic taint analysis. Number one challenge is under tainting. As I told you, everything starts from a taint source. What if a taint policy doesn't taint a malicious input? Because taint policy decides whether my input is malicious or not malicious. So under tainting means it doesn't taint a variable which actually is malicious. Okay? Over tainting means it taint everything, right? It taints everything. So everything is malicious, right? Which means false positives. Under tainting means false negatives. You may miss an attack. Third is taint sanitization. Now, if, if you know that while development, I always use libraries like ESAPI libraries to you know encode my input parameters, which actually sanitize my input. After using these sanitization functions, my input my variable won't be actually malicious, right? So how will a taint analysis know, how will a RASP and IS will know that this is a taint uh, sanitization function, right? So those has to be configured in taint policy, right? So finally, the challenges with RASP and IS. So of course, as you said, performance is one of the challenge with RASP, whether you are ready to instrument your production code for RASP. Second is taint analysis challenges, which is false positives are maybe there, false negatives may be there, right? Because of taint analysis challenges in taint analysis. Third is no protection from logical vulnerabilities. This is where DAST and hybrid solutions comes into picture. This is where IVS is right now. IVS and Sigital are. And similarly, IST has a challenge that time to discover a vulnerability is not actually fixing it, versus time to fix. Right? So if you have discovered, you still need to fix it. Inst instrumentation of production code, the same performance overhead problem. And then it, has, it also has all the problems of a DEST solution. Because you know, right, DEST, the, one of the major problem is how to discover the, all the application places where the, where the vulnerabilities can be there. Because of Ajax, because of Flash, because of HTML5, it cannot crawl whole of application. So if it cannot crawl whole of application, it cannot cover those areas, and so IS will also miss out those vulnerabilities, right? Okay, so this is my final slide. If you have question answers, if I have time, I can answer. Otherwise, I'm the available to you, and that's it. Thanks. So, like, I have covered two hours movie in half an hour. Okay, anyway, please. you say is it's a positive about RASP and IST? So positive about RASP is that it is works, it works better than, I mean, people are saying, okay, it works better than WAF. And theoretically also look, looks that it works better than WAF because it knows the execution flow. So, but, but then the last slide I tell you some of the question, you know, before you implement it, you should know what are the gray areas and why I should and I should not implement it. So by if you know more information, you just come, you know, we, we know what challenges it will have. So like finally, mm -hmm. when you have concluded, it seems that it has all the challenges which are there into DAST. So it seems that uh, hybrid is better to use like uh, uh, DAST and... Uh, so you are asking me question, what's DAST versus REST versus this? I'm telling you, so it's not versus, it is with, okay? It is not or, it is end, okay? So answer always lies in end, not or. You should not train your developers because you have RASP? No, answer is no. You should train your developers, but at the same time, you should have a RASP for zero-day zero attacks, right? Okay. Thank you.